Hi, welcome, Dr. Rennie. Welcome to Deep Into Sleep podcast. Thank you for having me. So I'm very excited. I know you've been in the uh, sleep medicine field for a while. And uh, to get started, just uh, want to, how about you introduce yourself a little bit to our audience and help us understand what gets you into the field of sleep medicine. Absolutely. So um, I am actually a neurologist by training. So I trained down here in Atlanta at Emory um, many years ago. I don't want to say how long ago because it will age me. Um, and I um, I got started during, after my neurology residency. Um, I had a big passion really for looking at preventive health. Um, and I see I saw a lot of that with sleep. So we are in the stroke belt and we found, you know, that you know, when you're seeing people with the catastrophic effects of stroke, you want to know what can we do to reduce the risk of that happening? Or, you know, just definitely in neurology, there are a lot of things like chronic pain as far as headaches and back pain that we would also see. And the idea that working in a field where you might be able to reduce the risk of that happening or the effects that has on someone was really exciting. And you get to work with kids and adults, which also was a passion for me. So that was how it started. And, um, you know, and started at Fusion Sleep Clinic, which is here in Atlanta, and, um, and have, was medical director there, still medical director there, and then became chief medical officer of Knox Health. Um, and that was earlier this year. Oh, congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. And I'm curious about children and teenagers, because I know a lot of um, researchers or, you know, sleep uh, clinicians they treat adults very well. But um, I feel like teenagers and children, their sleep issues are important and sometimes ignored by parents because I got a lot of questions from parents. They're like, children could have sleep disorders? How young could they start having it? Some Somehow they just feel like that's an adult thing. It's not a children thing. Um, you're 100% correct. And so we um, we see a lot of kids. So we see kids two years of age and up. And, you know, and our, our job and goal has been in our mind as well, again, to educate psychologists, schools, pediatricians, and a lot of times it comes from the parents. So a lot of these things are genetic. Um, so there's always the, definitely the environmental behavioral component that can be part of it genetically as well with a lot of the disorders we see. And so it's not uncommon that we see a parent and they say, you know what? they'll say, do you see kids? And say, you know, a lot of things I'm exhibiting, I had when I was younger and you know what, I'm seeing it in my child and they'll bring them in or they're able to talk to their friends and it becomes this word of mouth to say that as well. And so you're a hundred percent correct. There are things that we definitely see in kids that we do see in adults as well, for sure. Um, but we also see independently things that are very um, specific to kids as well. And so um, I think the big thing again for is, for us is to, yeah, identify, educate, diagnose, treat. Um, and we see the impacts that poor sleep has on kids. Um, you know, so for them, it may be hyperactivity. So they might have true ADHD, but also ADHD that may be secondary to an undiagnosed sleep disorder or may be exacerbated by that. Mm -hmm. Because when kids are tired, um, sometimes they get more hyper. They don't know how to self-soothe and settle down. Um, it's definitely hard to focus or remember things when you are sleep deprived, um, mood disorders as well. We often see learning challenges. Um, we definitely see that as well. And so, um, a hundred percent, you're absolutely correct. Mm. Wow. Sounds like children's, um, the way they show they are not sleeping well is quite different than what, how adults thinks it should be. Exactly correct. And, and we see that a lot and it's, um, you know, that's where, you know, it's, you're exactly correct. And just, you know, letting people know that kids can definitely have it. And if kids are having issues in their daytime, or if they're waking up a lot at night or kids are snoring, um, we, that's not normal. We wouldn't expect that. And kids shouldn't be, and some kids will be so tired that they will, you know, definitely, especially with our, you know, our narcolepsy, um, you know, kids in adipathic hypersomnia, which we do see around puberty, sometimes before that, you know, they'll sleep, you know, and, in, in, you know, during the day in cars and other situations. And, um, and that's, you know, would not be normal, you know, you wouldn't expect that. And so the question is, why is that happening? So definitely having people ask that question as to what could be going on that would cause it. It's not, you know, I can't, I'm not gonna say that everything out there is always secondary to a sleep disorder, 
but it's always something that should be in that differential. I really think, you know, neuropsychologists should include sleep evaluation in their testing process. I just talked to someone yesterday about it. I was like, you know, we have a lot of misdiagnoses like ADHD and other things, mood disorders. Nobody rule out sleep issues and then possibly not accurate enough. I love it. No, I think that's great. And it's, it's, and you're right, just it's asking the questions. And so yeah. if it's there, then it's always, I always kind of like the idea of just let's rule it out. Yeah. You know, you can't ever promise that by addressing and treating it, it's going to make everything else go away, but it may make it easier to treat. And in some cases it does go away or it gets a lot better. Um, and I would say there's no harm. Worst cases, you, you know, worst case, you don't have this issue anymore and you feel a little bit better, but um, at least we know how much of an impact it has on this. Yeah, I definitely want to try to incorporate that in my own clinic when we do neuropsychological assess, uh, assessment. We will try to see whether we can, you know, ask some questions about sleep. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> so another question, since we talk about children and teens, remind me, like, you know, I see some teenagers uh, in my clinic. Sometimes it's these parents really anxious and they think, oh, my, my teens, they don't sleep well, right? And then they book appointment for their teenagers. The teenagers coming in, when I talk to them about, you know, what's your concerns about their sleep? They're like, I'm fine. I just sleep a little late. I'm fine. So um, I definitely noticed that discrepancies in several cases. So I'm curious, is that common for teenagers have different treatment goals than their parents? Is that the parents too anxious or is the teenager just don't have motivation to work on their sleep? So that's an incredible, that's a great question. And I think it's a little bit of both. I do, um, you know, definitely think that there are certain cases where, um, you know, you're hearing that, you know, from the teenager that they feel like they're initiating sleep okay, they're getting their hours, it's easy for them to wake, they're not having any daytime dysfunction. And that's really the big thing is to look and say, is it a struggle for you to do this? You know, what does your quality of sleep look like? And really, how are you in the day? How are you having issues that we may attribute to issues with your sleep? And you're right, here the disconnect from what the parent's noticing versus what the report is from the child. And in some cases, it's you know a conversation that we have together and we'll say, let's watch together, let's see and, re and reevaluate. Um, you know, and then I think sometimes just having the open dialogue, I think sometimes the parents also just want us to, to really be there to help with reiterating maybe some sleep hygiene issues. So I think there is that component as well that sometimes they don't want to, you know, it's hard for them to get the phone out of the room or computer, or they have different feelings on what an appropriate bedtime should be. Um, and we, you know, we just discussed definitely, hey, for your age, this is many, how many hours that would make sense really for your you know, developing brain, how you're gonna do well cognitively in class and school, and especially if you're driving and with making decisions, which we know that teenage brains are still not fully developed and we might have more issues um, with impulsive decision-making. And so definitely improving sleep helps, you know? Um, and so I think part of that is just making sure we're all on the same page, but you're absolutely correct that sometimes parents and kids don't have the same feelings. And I've definitely also seen that with, you know, some of my, you know, with some of the people that I see who have narcolepsy, um, you know, where, they, you know, also what they feel is a, you know, um, an appropriate therapeutic response, you know, where some say, you know, I'm better than where I am, I'm able to do these things. But, you know, I think the expectations on both sides don't always meet. And it, it's again, finding that common ground together, um, which is hard. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I like that approach. And at the same time, I'm thinking, wow, if the child is really losing sleep, right? They just refuse to go to bed early or for anxiety or whatever issues. Um, the parents think that's healthy. They should go to bed a little bit earlier. Uh, what, what can we do to those teenagers? Like, it, do we educate parents, coach parents how to, you know, uh, have a electronic curfew or something? I'm just curious how you guys handle it it's hard it's and those we try so i think we we do educate on you know that teens around puberty that we are going to see a natural delayed sleep phase that they won't go to bed like they used to at nine o'clock 
and it's going to be harder for them to do that. But definitely there are things that they may do that may make it even more difficult. Mm -hmm. And so what can we do to remove that? So one of it may be don't let them sleep until two or three in the afternoon on the weekends, because then when Sunday night comes around, there's no way that they're going to be able to go to bed earlier. Um, so part of it is that consistency, which we talked about with adults as well, of keeping your sleep and wake time relatively similar, um, somewhat within the same time zone. So I would say, you know, don't, you don't want to travel every weekend and lose three, you know, if you're waking up three to four hours, you know, for later than what you do during the week, you're going to feel like you're permanently jet lagged. So let's, keep that sleep and wake time consistent, which will help push your sleep drive. Um, a lot of teens like to stay in their room. And that's another issue we find is that they come home from school, they're in their room. And so the delineating of what your school study space and your sleep space isn't really there. And that can sometimes prolong, you know, when they go to bed. Um, definitely you're right about the electronic curfew. They might have their computers in their room, phones, they're texting, they're doing all that. They do it during the day. So really, I mean, kids are on devices. I mean, pretty much from when they get up until when they go to bed, which also will one keeps their brain stimulated, but naturally delays that sleep time. Um, and so it's really kind of working on habits. Let's make sure that they're getting some activity outside. Let's make sure we're not drinking caffeine in the afternoon or evenings. Let's really work on giving that technology break, both to reduce, you know, light, you know, suppressing melatonin, but also to really get the brain to decompress mm -hmm. and see if it kind of enables it. And then being realistic on what a sleep time would be appropriate at that age mm -hmm. um, to hopefully achieve the hours they need, but also to kind of meet that parental teenage disagreement on what should be expected <laughs> yeah wow that's that's sounds like a different direction of work right yeah. so i think that's why i make teenager work so complicated it's not just them it's the whole family system if they don't sleep well their parents may not function well during the day but if they won't sleep well the parents possibly need to be part of the picture <laughs> That is 100% correct. And you're right, it is. And that's what sleep in general is. It doesn't just affect the person. It affects the whole family unit. And so, you know, we see that with every disorder, definitely with a teenage parent, you know, that that's hard because you do have parents who either go to bed early, but now they're worrying about the fact that their child is still up or they stay up with them until they go to bed. And then that's hard on them and they're not getting enough hours or they're angry about it. And it, it creates this, um, yeah, it creates conflict um, or, you know, or if someone's sleep is disrupted, you know, and we definitely see that with partners, if someone has disruptive sleep and it affects the other, it, again, it creates that. So definitely making sure everybody's on the same page tends to be a more successful way of getting someone, you know, to be able one, to make the behavioral changes needed um, and then maintain it. You know, I think that definitely helps if you have someone there to support you with it, but also having the same goals. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's that's so important to align the treatment goal within the whole family members. I love that. Yeah. Uh-huh. So uh you mentioned to help teenagers increase their activity levels during the day, right? I remember when I took the board exam before. Also, there was one lecture I listened, uh, some psychologists also emphasized that for the behavioral. Uh, interventions, you need to, you know, exercise more, more activities. So I'm curious, why that is so important for teenagers? Or do they naturally just uh, don't have enough activities for them? They don't. I mean, I'm, I, and I can speak from personal experience with a child of mine that has went, has gone from middle school to high school, and they don't have, you know, it's not that they have, you know, PE in the day or recess time, these things that they had where you would burn off some energy and go outside. Um, you know, really you're in classes all day and you're sitting in front of a screen throughout that whole day. So they're pretty sedentary. They're in front of a device. And then, you know, if, if they're not involved in a sport where they naturally have to go out, then it's you on your own have to essentially create that time to say, it's almost a mental break as well. Um, I think is where that comes important, you know, where it becomes important, because I think in general, teenagers already are dealing with a lot of issues where one, they probably aren't getting enough hours for what they need. Um, 
you know, they're on devices, both in school and then, you know, navigating the idea of social media and all the things that go with it. Mm -hmm. And I think the idea of taking a break from a device of any sort to go outside, one, it's good to get the natural light to be active that already just act energy or exercise, sorry, in general is important for being able to fall asleep and stay asleep. We definitely know that it can help insomnia therapy, but from a mental health perspective, it can also be incredibly helpful. And so it's just allowing that time to say, this is my time away from everyone else, just to be able to do this, whatever that activity is. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Great to know. And thanks for sharing that story. <laughs> Your own experience. <laughs> and I also want to ask you, uh, since you work in this field, a very experienced I I got some questions, you know, from the audience and from my friends. They are curious about um, what happened during our sleep, um, like uh, sleepwalking, sleep eating, and uh, and the uh, sex somnia. Uh, sex somnia. Yeah, something. someone, some of my friends watched that on the news. They were like, "Oh, this is so cool! Like people could do this." I was like, "That's not cool. That co could." make people in trouble <laughs> yes we have medical legal issues that come up with that one for sure yeah so i'm curious whether you can share a little bit about that to our audience absolutely so we call these behaviors parasomnias so they are behaviors that happen during sleep and they're all learned behaviors so you know i would say that someone who has not learned to walk a baby yet will not be able to sleepwalk um, but once you're able to, then they would be able to, and same with sleep driving, they wouldn't be able to get in the car and go until you learn this behavior. So they're innate learned behaviors um, that arise at an undesirable time, which is during sleep. Often they are happening out of our deep or slow wave sleep. So typically, usually in that more first third of the night, um, there is a different type we can talk about, which are behaviors that happen out of our REM sleep, where you physically go through a motion of a dream. And often the person is has some awareness that they're doing that. And that typically um, happens more second half of the night. But for the ones you're talking about, which is night terrors, sleepwalking, sleep talking, um, sleep eating, yes, the sex omnias, um, often initially you see it's very it's actually not uncommon to see sleepwalking, night terrors, and you know, sleep talking in kids. Um, and so, you know, typically with these developing brains, they have a lot more slow wave sleep and that the percentage of that tends to go down as we get older. Um, it's not necessarily, it's definitely not uncommon. It's not necessarily that something that you have to do something about unless it causes, you know, safety issues or it's becoming frequent or they're having disruptions during the day because of it. And we think that there may be a sleep disorder that they have that may be causing these issues. Um, but oftentimes they can outgrow it. And a lot of times they can run in families. Um, but definitely as we get older and we continue to still have these issues, the question for us is, is there something happening maybe within their sleep that's affecting their quality of sleep that's triggering these things to happen? So a lot of times we can see it coexist with obstructive sleep apnea or restless leg syndrome. Um, sometimes even medicines people take may prompt these behaviors. So, you know, definitely we want to try to figure out, is it something that you've always had? Have you always been someone who's been a sleepwalker and it's progressed and you never really outgrew it? Or is this a new thing that happened? And if so, was there anything around that time? You know, did you start a new medicine? Did you change a dose? Or do you have maybe these other issues going on with your sleep that may be causing it? Um, and then looking at their hours of sleep, any stressors, so really kind of carving away at all of that to see what may be triggering it. Oh, wow. That's good to know. And I love that to, to really think about the triggers, right? Because I think a lot of families, they may want to know, okay, other than seeing a doctor, taking medication uh, as a family unit or as parents, what can we do? Uh, how can we support this person, this family member with this sleep issues and i know some not only children adults could have some of this too right i don't know whether it's because it did not outgrow it or not yet or it got triggered yeah it, it could be all of it and with adults we see that some might have had some degree of it when they were younger um you know or some as you said it just kind of 
progressed and maybe got worse or didn't get better. And then for some, they've never had it. And then all of a sudden it's come up. Um, and, you know, and then definitely, you know, in either case, if anyone's an adult and still has it, to me, it's, it wouldn't be expected or normal to still have this as an adult. You know, usually really by early teen years, you would expect a lot of that to have resolved even younger than that. And so, um, you know, definitely looking at the frequency, the impact, but definitely as our adults, it's okay, let's carve away at everything to see what do we think could be a potential cause of it. So, um, and, you know, definitely right. It's not always medication, you know, there are medicines to treat it, but definitely that's always our last resort. It's should we remove something, you know, have you been put on Ambien, you know, some antidepressants can be a trigger. Um, have you been under a lot of stress or not getting enough hours? And then, yeah, definitely looking for intrinsic sleep issues like sleep apnea or maybe restless leg syndrome that also may be an underlying cause. Wow. Sounds like a lot of testing need to be done to really figure out and how people can, um, you know, diagnose this, this uh, restless leg syndrome and all the other sleep disorders you talk about. Do they just go to see a sleep doctor? So it helps, definitely. There are, you know, each one of them might require a different way to diagnose. So restless leg syndrome can be a clinical diagnosis. So in that meaning that they, you know, have um, symptoms that, you know, define it. So there are four symptoms we look for, which is um, an irresistible urge to want to move typically their legs, but can be really anywhere in the body. But legs tend to be the more most frequent location where it's affected. Rest tends to make it worse moving it tends to make it better and it tends to occur in that evening period often before bed but for some can start earlier in the evening and so usually that's it right there and so if someone exhibits all of that you can make the diagnosis of restless leg syndrome um, some people don't have the restless legs per se but they have what we call periodic limb movement disorder which you would need a sleep study to diagnose where they might not have the clinical symptoms of restless legs but they have periodic movements when they're sleeping that disrupt their quality of sleep. Um, so that is one where, you know, I would say, you know, you don't have to have, you can have restless leg syndrome and not have, um, and often a lot of periodic leg movements, but don't necessarily have to, and you don't need a sleep study to diagnose it, but you would need the sleep study to diagnose periodic limb movement in someone who doesn't have um, restless leg syndrome. Okay. Yeah. So there are ways to really figure it out, diagnose it. But uh, sounds like they need a professional opinions, right? I know some people tend to online check, check, and then self-diagnose. <laughs> it's true. And it helps. I mean, I think it helps. So then you can talk through together and, you know, go through that. Sometimes people might look at one, but not realize that maybe they have other things that are affecting what they've been trying to do to treat one. And we see that a lot, meaning they have Russell Sykes syndrome. They've been, you know, trying to work it up, you know, and maybe have been put on medications by maybe their primary care or someone else. I'm not saying it's inappropriate, but just to say, hey, I'm not getting the response I was hoping for. I'm still having issues. And so then our goal is to say, well, is there other stuff going on that may be affecting your therapy? Um, and so are you on other things that may be irritating it? Or could you have coexisting sleep apnea? And that potentially can also trigger restless legs and sometimes bring it out. And so sometimes when you treat that, that may help treat it. So some of it is just working together to say, hey, let's see what you have here. And our goal is to start crossing off the list to see what we can make better and what we can identify. Yeah, I love that approach. That would be great, right? So any audience listening to this, right? If you want to check out some symptoms, some information online, do so, but bring it with you together and discuss with a sleep doctor. Absolutely. Yes, our goal is to help try to make it an easier process so that someone doesn't have to necessarily, you know, have all the answers. We don't expect it. We want to, you know, but educate, go through it together and see if we can get to the root cause. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Uh, I have last question. Sorry. Sure. Yeah, this <laughs> is great. great. I love to this. be able to communicate with you. So another thing, a lot of my parents really worry about their children are sleep terrors, even very occasional ones, not very yeah. severe ones. So I, because I think it's such a disorder among children that terrifies parents. It's, it's make a big deal, make big noise, and the children's reaction could be huge at night. So uh, I know a lot of parents worry about, will this really something could be treated or will they really get better in the future? And another worry is, you know, at that age, children will have other activities outside of the house, 
right? Sleep over, camp, and other things. So I can understand the parents' anxiety. They don't know, oh, should we just not let our kids go to anything? Or should we have to tell everyone about this problem? How are they going <laughs> to perceive our kids, right? So I'm, I'm curious about how, um, like, whether this is something you notice and how you educate parents about that. No, it's a great question. I mean, sleep terrors are frightening. And they're, it's frightening to everybody but the person going through it because they don't typically remember anything. They don't know, but it's like, it's, it's frightening, especially the first time, because, you know, one, it, it's, uh, it's like clockwork. I mean, it's usually that hour and a half, you know, right after falling asleep, somewhere in that hour and a half to three hour mark. And it sounds like this person, you know, it sounds like your child is personally, you know, just is terrified, feels like they're being attacked. Often they can have a pretty scary image and they, you know, and they can talk about this and, and the parent is watching this. And going, what can I do? This can't be normal. And honestly, you know, it really is one is not, a, it, it is a normal thing that we can see when kids are younger, they do um, outgrow it. And if they don't, definitely we're here to see why. If it's very frequent, of course, we want to know why. Um, and that's what we want to help to figure out. It is, it is incredibly scary um, for anyone to notice. And I think the other hard part we always tell parents is the best way to deal with a night terror is to not get in front of them. So let your child go through this, but sometimes, you know, you want to go there and you want to comfort them. You, you're like, oh no, my child is in pain and they're scared. I want to make that go away. But inadvertently, it can sometimes prolong that night terror. And so typically the best thing you can do is maybe just soothe them from the side, just talk, say, hey, it's okay. We're here, but don't physically go there. Um, and, you know, just so that we can, we don't prolong it. Um, but it is, you're right. I mean, I think that's definitely the big thing we hear is the sleepover part of it camps. What do we do? Um, and, um, and it, it's a tough question. I mean, definitely it the nice thing about night hair is it tends to get better by the time they're doing a lot of these overnight activities. Um, sleepwalking definitely could still go on, but night hairs tend to start getting a little bit better. Um, but it, it's a lot of it to hopefully give reassurance that, you know, that it, it, that your child is okay, that, that you know, that, that they're not being affected by it the way the parent is being affected and everyone else. Um, but of course, again, if it seems that it's out of normal, it's not getting better or it's getting worse, we want to double check to see if there's something that's affecting it. Yeah, yeah. Again, to find the other, you know, triggers, right? Yes. Uh, factors around it to really guide the family and what, whether there's anything they could do about it. Exactly. Yeah. Cause sometimes it can be, you know, are there stressors at school or somewhere else that may be affecting their sleep and maybe increasing it. So it's trying to tie in to say, Hey, do we see anything obvious going on? You know, we've had some where some had some night terrors and it really picked up after they moved to a new house. The child was, you know, now staying in the same room as a sibling and that seemed to amplify it. And then, you know, in time, it got better when things stabilized. And so sometimes to say, hey, did something change that may have increased it? Um, so those are usually the first things we look for. And if there's nothing obvious, definitely we all delve into, could there be other things going on in the sleep itself that may also be a trigger, like restless leg syndrome or sleep apnea? Yeah, you know, one thing I love sleep uh, medicine field is I feel like we all somewhat detectives, right? Yes. We are looking at all these clues and piece them together and try to get a better picture of this case and understand it. <laughs> that's the fun part about it. I, I totally agree. I think that's the fun part. And it's always the fun part as I think about sleep medicine is that typically when you see someone, they get better. Um, and that is such a rewarding feeling to when somebody can t feel the benefit of what it's like to sleep better. Um, it makes it even more fun to be the detective to say, I want to get you there. Um, and so it's, it's awesome. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Thank you, Dr. Randy, for sharing all this wonderful information with us. Uh, any, if any audience are curious about your work, where can they find you or read more about your work? Absolutely. So um, we, our website is knoxhealth.com and I welcome anyone to come check us out. And yes, we are here and we want to help. Great. And sounds like people out of the Atlanta area can also reach out to you and uh, find the help, right? Absolutely. That's awesome. That's really needed. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> now I feel like sleep is a global issue, <laughs> but the resources are so limited. Agree. And that is where we hope to change it. We want that is the ultimate goal is to make sleep accessible to everybody. Yeah, I hope, you know, with, with, with your effort, with many other people's efforts, this goal is going to be achieved soon. <laughs> yes. And thank you for doing this. This is a good way to get that message across. Yeah, definitely. Uh, and before we end, I'm curious, any other, any final wisdom, any final words to whoever listening or curious about sleep? Absolutely. So I think if anybody is um, feels that, you know, their sleep is not restorative, that it is a struggle to get to sleep, um, they wake up a lot at night, or they just don't feel rested the next morning, or they have issues in the day feeling fatigued, tired, sleepy, um, you know, to definitely, you know, talk with your doctor about seeing if, you know, there may be something going on with your sleep that may be impacting how you feel. Yeah, love that. So be cautious about your own body yes. and then try to get the help and check it out as soon as possible. A hundred percent. Yes, we are, uh, we are our best advocates. So definitely. Yeah, definitely love that. Thank you so much, Dr. Rani. Thank you. Nice talking to you. Bye. Nice talking to you. Have a great day.